Hi, and welcome to the National Association of Watch and Clock Collectors Introduction to Horology Series. This video series is designed as an introduction to mechanical clocks. It's a good starting point for anyone interested in collecting, repairing, restoring, or even building their own clock. In this video, we're going to discuss mechanical clock movements. After watching this video, you should understand the concept of wheel trains and be able to identify the three most common types of mechanical clock movements. You'll also begin to understand some of the unique vocabulary used by professionals working in the clock trade. So let's get started. Hidden behind the face of every mechanical clock is a movement. A movement is a collection of gears, springs, cams, weights, and levers that are typically mounted between brass plates. A group of gears that interact with each other to accomplish a specific function, like telling time, is called a gear train. Clock professionals refer to a gear train as a wheel train. The simplest type of clock movement has only one wheel train that moves the clock hands around the dial to display the time. This is a graphic representation of all the wheels that make up a typical time-only wheel train. There's only one main group of gears or wheels, as they are referred to in the clock trade, and every wheel in this simple train plays a role in moving the clock hands around the dial. This is the same set of wheels assembled between brass plates into a single train time-only movement. The brass plates hold all the parts in their proper positions so that they can interact with each other to accomplish their designated functions. In this case, there is only one wheel train, so there's only one function, which is to move the clock hands around the dial to indicate the time. The time train in a clock is often called the going train. This is because the time train must operate or go continuously if the clock is to accurately display the time. The going train is the heart of the clock. Almost all other functions in more complicated clocks depend on the going train for proper operation. Time-only movements range in quality from ultra-precision movements used in astronomical regulators to inexpensive movements like the one shown here. Astronomical regulators are designed to run for decades and keep accurate time to better than one second per year. They got the name astronomical regulator because these ultra-precision timekeepers were used in observatories before the advent of modern atomic clocks. Inexpensive movements like the one shown here sacrifice precision timekeeping and durability in the interest of much lower cost. In a low-cost movement like this one, many of the parts are mechanically stamped out of relatively thin metal. The plates, which act as the framework to hold all the parts in place, have only enough material to provide the minimum strength necessary for reliable operation. The rest of the material is cut away to reduce cost. This creates the open frame design that is typical of American mass-produced clocks of the mid-1800s to mid-1900s. Even though this type of movement was inexpensive and mass-produced, many of them are still operational after a hundred years or more of service. A simple spring-driven movement like the one shown was typically used in mass-produced time-only wall clocks found in stores, schoolrooms, and office buildings all across the country from the mid-1800s through about the mid-1940s. They were inexpensive and accurate to one or two minutes a week. Since a few seconds' error in time is of little consequence to everyday activities, the time was usually only corrected once a week when the clock was wound. Higher-grade clocks often have weight-driven movements. This is an example of such a movement. The plates are thicker and made of solid brass with no cutouts. A weight-driven movement needs to be stronger and more rigid to support the hanging weight that drives the clock. The gears are thicker and the gear teeth are individually machined rather than stamped from thin brass sheets. The overall workmanship, fit, and finish is much better than the less expensive mass-produced spring-driven movement. 
Higher-grade weight-driven clocks were often used as time standards in jewelry stores, hotel lobbies, and railroad stations. These clocks cost about ten times more than a similar spring-driven clock and were accurate to a few seconds per month. Even though clocks in railroad service were fairly accurate, their time was checked and corrected daily from a time signal sent via telegraph. Accuracy on railroads was critical because just a few seconds' error might cause a collision between trains going in opposite directions but sharing the same track. Every employee working on a train was required to carry a pocket watch of certified accuracy. When an employee went on shift, they were required to set their pocket watch to the master station clock to assure that everyone was working on the same precise time. Regardless of the cost or quality, a time-only clock can usually be identified by its having a single winding hole in the face of the clock to wind the single wheel train. The time train or going train is only one of many different types of wheel trains in a mechanical clock. Clocks that strike on the hour and half hour have a second wheel train called a strike train. Unlike the going train, the strike train runs intermittently, only when the clock is actually striking. This is a two-train movement that has both a going train and a strike train. It's an inexpensive mass-produced movement with an open frame. This movement is of similar quality and style to the open frame time-only movement we just reviewed. On the right side of this movement, we see the group of wheels that make up the going train. Remember, it is the going train that moves the hands around the clock dial to indicate the time. On the left is a second group of wheels that make up the strike train. You can see the strike hammer hanging below the strike train. When the movement is mounted in its case, the strike hammer is positioned over the strike gong. There's nothing forcing the going train to be located on the right and the strike train on the left. You will often find clocks where the order is reversed. A two-train movement like this is typical of American time and strike kitchen and mantel clocks. Millions of these clocks were made, and almost every household in America had at least one. This is an example of a typical American kitchen clock. You can see the case looks carved, but more often the designs were pressed into the wood with a steam press. This allowed the cases to be mass-produced at very low cost. This is a typical tambour-style mantel clock. This style of clock is still popular today. The movements in both the American kitchen and American mantel clocks are very similar. In fact, some manufacturers use the same movement with only a small change in gear ratios to allow for a shorter pendulum to fit in the tambour-style mantel clock. Otherwise, the movements were identical. As with time-only clocks, there's a fairly large range in the quality of time and strike clocks as well. Higher quality clocks are made from heavier components and have greater durability and accuracy, but by their very nature, multi-train clocks don't lend themselves to ultra-precision and aren't designed to be used as time standards or astronomical regulators. This is because the extra trains must interface with the going train, and this can introduce small inconsistencies in the going train's operation, affecting its long-term accuracy. Lower-grade clocks, like the one shown here, are accurate to one or two minutes a week. Higher-grade weight-driven movements might achieve accuracy to a few seconds a month. Beyond this, the extra cost of more expensive clocks would usually go into decorative casework. Time and strike clocks have two winding holes in the face of the clock, one to wind the going train and the other to wind the strike train. Another popular clock chimes on the quarter hour. Clocks that chime also strike the hour as well. The chime function is separate from the strike function. Clocks that chime have three separate gear trains, a going train to tell the time, a chime train to play a melody on the quarter hours, and a strike train to strike the hour. This is a typical three-train chiming movement. Notice that even this less expensive movement has solid brass plates with no large openings. 
Three train movements have many stresses within them. These stresses are caused by the torque of the three springs or three driving weights necessary to run all three wheel trains. The solid plates help keep these stresses under control so that all the parts remain properly aligned. On the front panel of this movement are all the levers and cams that control the operation of the chime and strike trains. We'll address the operation of strike and chime mechanisms in a future video. If you look down on top of this movement, on the right side between the brass plates, you'll find the group of wheels that make up the chime train. The chime train controls the playing of the chime melody on the quarter hours. On the back of the movement, directly behind the chime train, you can see a portion of the chime barrel and the chime hammer assembly. The chime barrel has fingers like a music box. As the chime train rotates the chime barrel, the fingers on the chime barrel lift and drop the chime hammers in proper sequence to play the melody. On the left between the plates is the group of wheels that make up the strike train. On the back of the movement directly behind the strike train, you can see a portion of the strike hammer assembly. In this case, there are four strike hammers. But notice that there is no strike barrel to manipulate each hammer separately. All the strike hammers are connected to a solid rod and all hammers lift and drop together. When the hammers drop, they strike several chime rods or tubes at the same time. This is often done to create the full rich tone of a musical chord that could not be achieved with one strike hammer alone. Using multiple hammers to strike the hour is most common in clocks with smaller cases where there's no room for a large deep resonant gong. In the middle between the chime and strike trains is the group of wheels that make up the going train. In the case of chiming clocks, it's usual to have the going train in the middle. This allows the clock hands to be more easily centered to the dial. It also allows both the chime and strike trains on either side to have direct mechanical access to the going train in the middle. This way, the strike and chime trains can be triggered by the going train to operate at the proper times. Just as in the two-train clock, there is no advantage for the chime and strike wheel trains to be on a specific side. It's not unusual to find the chime and strike trains reversed with the chime on the left and the strike on the right. Many grandfather clocks, mantel clocks, and table clocks are three-train chiming clocks. As in all multi-train clocks, there's a practical limit on the expected accuracy of these clocks because of their multi-train design. The best are accurate to a few seconds per month. Higher grade movements are usually weight driven, have greater durability, and often allow the selection of more than one chime melody. Westminster is the most common chime melody, but there are many others like St. Michael's, Whittington, and even Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. More expensive clocks usually have elaborate casework of rare or exotic materials, and grandfather or long case clocks may have high quality tubular chimes rather than the less expensive chime rods. Chiming clocks usually have three winding holes in the face of the clock one to wind the going train, one to wind the strike train, and one to wind the chime train. Striking and chiming clocks are the most common multi train clocks but there are many clocks with specialty functions requiring additional specialized wheel trains. There are clocks that have calendar functions, show the ocean tides, planetary movement, and even astrological signs that reflect our view of the heavens throughout the year. Just about anything that has a recurring time cycle can be translated into gear ratios and a wheel train and then displayed on the face of a clock. This is a typical phase of the moon dial on a grandfather clock. It displays the 29 and a half day cycle from new moon to the next new moon. Extra functions beyond telling time in both clocks and watches are called complications. Each of these functions or complications has its own wheel train to accomplish that specific function. Some complications, such as calendar, ocean tides, and phase of the moon can be executed as extensions of an existing wheel train, like the going train. 
These parasitic wheel trains are driven by the power source of the wheel train they extend from. Here we see a clock with a calendar showing the month, date, and day of the week on a separate dial in the base of the clock. Note that there is no winding hole on the calendar dial and only one winding hole on the clock face. This tells us the movement in this clock is time only and that the calendar function is being driven as an extension of the time train. Other complications like chime, strike, and alarm functions require more power than the going train can deliver. This is why these trains usually have their own independent power source as part of their wheel trains. In our next video, we'll take a look at the operation of the time or going train in more detail.